Good morning and welcome to Dogwood Life. Thank you for joining us. Today we are speaking at Peace Community Church in Taylor and we are talking about a fence. So I hope you enjoy it. I hope that uh, if God has something for you to hear that you would be patient and you would be willing to hear. Love you. Good morning. That last song, though the race has been run, the race is complete, my lips still repeat, not I, but through Christ in me. That is my prayer every time I get up here. Um, I don't want this to be me. I want this to be God. And I am not always the most eloquent. And God has shown me that that's okay. The topic I have this morning is are you willing to offend for Jesus. A lot of times we don't want to ruffle feathers. We don't want to upset people. And obviously we're not talking about walking down the street calling people names or cursing like a sailor or anything like that. I'm talking about being bold enough in your faith in Jesus to share everything that that stands for in biblical truth that's going to offend people. Jesus offended the Pharisees and the religious leaders regularly because he wasn't the savior that they were expecting to see. And when he proclaimed himself as the son of God, well, it upset them a little bit. Mark 2, 1 and 12, 1 through 12, pardon me. When he had come back to Capernaum several days afterward, and it was heard that he was at home, and many were gathered together, for there was no longer room, not even near the door. And he was speaking the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Being unable to get to him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had dug an opening, they let down the pallet on which the paralyzed man was laying. Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus, aware in the way they were thinking, Why are you reasoning about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, go pick up your mat and walk, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins? He said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. He got up, immediately picked up the pallet, and went out of sight of everyone so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. On a complete side note, this scripture has always sort of stuck out to me as showing how important your circle is. It isn't written because of your faith you are healed. It is written that Jesus saw their faith, that group of people, so determined that Jesus could heal this man that it just has always really pushed to me that it's not just us. It's the people we surround ourselves with help to show and to, um, to glorify God. The other thing we notice here is that when these teachers... They were definitely offended by what Jesus was saying and doing. But that wasn't what Jesus was setting out to do. He didn't want to go out and offend people. He was out there showing an act of extreme love and bringing healing on the paralyzed man. He could have ignored the commotion. He could have condemned them for interrupting him as he was trying to teach and preach. But that wasn't the way he did things. Offense was never the objective although it seemed like often came with the territory. So what was the objective? If we really think about Jesus, 
what would you consider to be characteristics of Jesus? How would you describe him? I think the two passages for me, one is Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those are all pretty good describers of Christ. The other that I come back to often is 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 13. If I speak with tongues of men and of angels, but I do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If you've ever heard somebody just beating on the cymbals with no rhyme or reason on a drum set, it's a little offensive on the head. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all the mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all of my possessions to feed the poor and surrender my body to be burned, but I do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, and it does not seek its own. It is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. And when I was a child, I spoke like a child, thought like a child, and reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have also been fully known. But now faith, hope, love, abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Between the love chapter and the fruit of the Spirit verses, I've always figured this is an awfully good start of describing Jesus Christ. He loved beyond comprehension and beyond comparison. And he acted out the fruit of the spirits on a regular daily basis. By living that way and by following the Father's plan, people will take offense. I don't think that has changed in today's world either. But how we bring up these things makes a critical difference. We can be bold and upfront and in people's faces when we're sharing, but what we need to remember is we want to share God's love first and foremost and not to condemn. But if we come at people and we're condemning and we're preaching and, and upfront and, and not showing God's love in that, we may never get another chance to talk to that person. We may come into the room and they see us and they're out the back door. We don't want to be that hypocritical stumbling block that prevents someone from being curious and interested in learning more. And the scriptures are extremely clear about that as well. In Matthew 18, 1 to 9, the disciple came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say unto you, unless you are converted and you become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. It is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to that man through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into the eternal fire. 
If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than two eyes and be cast into a fiery hell. He does not leave a lot of room to negotiate. Welcome the child of God in. And I do, as I do, and do not cause them to stumble. So we'll say it again. When we interact, when we try and share God's love and God's story, we need to balance that line of making sure that we are biblically accurate. It has to be God's truth that we're sharing. But to remain in love. What is the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the next, to love yourself. So if you're doing that and they take offense, as the leaders often did in Jesus' time, that's not on you anymore. But that can't change our heart of sharing in love. And that was Matthew 22, 36 to 40. What is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the entire law and the prophets. So I guess my takeaway for today is pretty simple. We need to share God's love. We need to share our testimonies. And we need to share the amazing things that we've seen God do in our lives and around us. By sharing these things in love, we may limit the chance of someone taking offense at us, but we will not always avoid it. We shouldn't expect to always avoid it. We've seen in the scriptures we've read today, earthly mindsets are always going to be offended by God's way. It's always been that way, but all we can control is how we share. So my encouragement today is to as we go from here and we look to share and to encourage God's plan is to do that in love, to do it in the scriptures, and not to stress where it goes from there. We cannot, we, a lot of times we'll share, we'll be a seed, someone else down the road will water it. But if we come across so abrupt and we're smashing it in, that seed may never flourish no matter how much water or sunlight or soil it has. So that, uh, that was really what I had on my heart today. We were listening to something a little while back and it spoke on offense and it just got me thinking about that it's like are we willing to share our story if it offends people and in another study i was at one of the gentlemen there shared an opinion he had and he shared it so abrupt and he was so forceful and and determined about it ahead of time that three people got up out of the room and left. And so then I had to take a step back as I was preparing this and go, okay, yeah, we're going to offend, but how we bring that across will totally change that scenario. You can have opinions that people aren't going to agree with. But if you bring it up in love, if you can have a civil conversation with people you don't instantly dr um, drive them away that they'll never talk to you or anyone who thinks like you again. And that's really what it's about. And just the, the turn of events with that really got me to think and to dig in. And, and it did. It changed where I was going with this uh, quite a bit. And I think that's what God does sometimes. He gives us that nudge and we start going in one direction and then he's got to run over to the other side and sort of poke us back and well no not not quite that far but um 
thank you all for coming out tonight and I'll just or this afternoon and I'll just stop in prayer. Lord, we just we thank you for the option we have to come together and meet to study your word, to share your word, and to encourage one another. Lord, I just pray that as we go from this house, from the safety of your home, Lord, that you would still give us the boldness, the courage, and the faith to share your story, to share our testimonies, but to share in love, Lord. We don't always see the results of what we share, but you do, and you know what is happening in the hearts of those we share with. And I just thank you for that. I pray that you would be with each of us as we go from here today. We thank you for the sunshine, and we just pray that you would guide and protect us from here. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. So thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed what you heard, and we will see you next time.